Hello everybody, my name is Vasya Karasava. I am one of Adal's MA students and today I am going to talk to you about the main focus of my thesis, image-based sexual abuse, a form of technology facilitated sexual violence. To start off, we need to recognize that we are currently undergoing a major cultural shift. Technology has implicated every aspect of our lives with some recent estimates showing adults spending more than six hours online. As a consequence of that, the ways we interact and communicate with each other have also changed. And this includes dating. More and more people now report having met their significant other online and there's plenty of dating apps to choose from. But we need to keep in mind that there may be a darker side to that. As the ways we date and interact with each other evolve, so do the ways harm, including sexual abuse, are perpetrated. After all, the internet never forgets. It creates a permanent digital record, which can be a good thing when a moment you want to chase forever is only a couple of clicks away. But what about other moments we don't want to remember as months, or that we didn't want to serve with the wider audience in the first place? And this is where image-based sexual abuse comes in. Iman sexual abuse refers to the non-consensual creation, distribution, or th threat of distribution of sexually explicit images. In the media, the term IBSA is usually interchangeable with revenge pornography. However, revenge porn as a term is very restrictive, both in the form of perpetration that it describes, as well as the motivations behind it. Really, revenge porn refers to one specific form of IBSA, the non-consensual dissemination of intimate images. And even for that, it's not an ideal term. It is very victim-blaming in nature. It sort of implies that the victim did something. From the start, it makes you wonder, what did that person do to deserve re revenge, to drive someone else to releasing their sexual pictures online? But the truth is, no one, no matter what, deserves this to happen to them. Other types of IPSA include cyber flashing, aka dick pics. Now, the term a dick pics is not ideal again because a lot of those sexual images do not include genitals and they're not uh, only sent by pe people with uh, penises. So we are going to stick with cyber flashing. We also have upskirting or down blousing and the newer thread in the horizon, deep fake non consensual pornography. Now, before we get into all of the different forms of IBC and the nitty gritty of what each of them is, I'd like to take a moment and pause and recognize that even though the abuse does not take place face to face, it can have very real and devastating effects on those who are targeted. Because of the way the internet works, images that are uploaded online may be re-uploaded hundreds or even thousands of times and flood the victim's Google name search, making it all the way, all the more easier for their family or friends and even co-workers to see their intimate images online. This can have financial repercussions. A lot of uh, employers uh, report that they haven't that they, or that they wouldn't uh, hire someone because of nude or sexual images of them online. You can also have other type of uh, repercussions. Those who have experienced some form of IBSA, similar to survivors of face-to-face -face sexual abuse, are at a high risk of developing anxiety, depression, or even PTSD. So obviously, those are very, very alarming. And in our work for my thesis, we found that about one in three of our sample, which was a sample of young adults, uh, it's a student sample here at Carlton, reported that at some point in their life, ever since they were 16, someone had either threatened uh, with the distribution of one of the nude or sexual images online, distributed that image, or did both. On the flip coin, uh, one in six of our participants reported that they had engaged in some form of uh, non-consensual dissemination of nude or sexual images. Uh, these prevalence rates of one in three and one in six may, be they may appear high, but they have also been corroborated in previous work. For example, in a sample of more than 100,000 uh, Australians, uh, and that was a community sample too. In Canada, the dissemination without permission of nude or sexual images is illegal and reprehensible by law, and you can get up to five years in prison if you do that. 
To date, there have been about 5,000 cases reported to the police of non-consensual dissemination, and 851 of them have resulted in charges. Now, a lot of the cases are still ongoing because of criminal investigations that take a lot of time. Uh, the process is very lengthy, but it could also be a sign of underreporting if we extrapolate that one in three prevalence to the whole of Canada. And underreporting would be in line with other forms of sexual abuse, and it is uh, something that we should uh, consider moving forward. We also found in our work that women were more likely to be victims. Uh, men more likely to have engaged in uh, disseminating intimate images. And one other interesting uh, result well, that we found was that those with a history of perpetration were more likely to also report victimization and vice versa. Now, because of the cross-sectional uh, nature of our work, we are not able to reach a conclusion. And you have to remember that correlation does not equate position. So we have to keep a fairly um, restricted language when we discuss about this, but more work should look into that. The next form of IBSA we are going to discuss is cyberflashing, and that includes the sending of unsolicited nude or sexual images uh, using media devices. Now, that could be through social media, DMs, uh, messaging apps, emails, SMS, or even airdrop. There's, now, there, that is very different than sexting, which takes place between two consenting adults. There's nothing inherently wrong or pathological about expressing your sexuality using technology or sharing intimate images with someone else, as long as there is consent. So consent is, as the youth say, key. And remember to ask your partner if they are comfortable with you sending them sexual images before you do so. Upskirting and downplacing are fairly straightforward. They refer to what the words say, which is taking pictures of someone's uh, upper skirts, their underwear and the crotch area, down their blouse or the breasts area, without their permission or often knowledge. And then those photos are commonly shared online. A lot of um, uh, pornographic websites have even a whole section uh, dedicated to upskirting and down blousing, but we really don't really know much about these types of IBSA and more work should be put into them. Now the newer threat is deepfake pornography. Deepfake media productions refer to the use of machine learning tools to doctor a non-explicit image of a person in the sexually explicit material. Usually, they, they, they use deep learning to superimpose the face of someone, usually a famous woman, onto the body of a female uh, porn star. Now, now, as you can imagine, defects can be used for really disturbing purposes. A recent estimate found that more than 95% of the fake videos are pornographic in nature. We have to take into consideration that there are two people involved, the, the person with the face and the person with the body, but usually we have a focus on the face, but there are really two people that are being victimized in this situation. Alarmingly, the threshold required to produce the fake content is constantly reduced. This search in the accessibility and commodification of deepfake technology leaves public figures and private citizens vulnerable to victimization. Currently, anyone with an online presence and pictures of themselves on social media may appear without their consent or even knowledge in a pornographic video. And more work should be put into policy as well as research behind uh, finding deepfakes, taking them down, and punishing those who upload deepfake pornography without consent. Now, where do we go from here? There is so much more to do relating to IBSA from all perspectives, academic policy, as well as activism perspectives. And we should all be focused on how we can support victims, how we can uh, stop IBSA, or how can we ameliorate the effect that it has on the survivors. And if you want to learn more about it, here are some journal articles to start from. Uh, there's also a YouTube video, which is kind of a lecture by Dr. Dean Fido and Dr. Craig Harper. I have put the link if you want it, uh, as well as a couple of podcasts that focus on uh, IBSA. One of them is from Dr. Uh, 
uh, Henry, uh, uh, which is one of the people who came up with the term technology facilitated sexual violence and IPSA, as well as a, a talk with a person who has experienced uh, someone sharing their private image online uh, in, in is a revenge porn survival. So that is a, a great talk to listen to if you want to hear it from the perspective from with someone who lived in experience which is always a great perspective to, to take. And finally, if you or a person you know have experienced some form of IBSA, here are some resources for you. A lot of those resources are a bit more generic in nature uh, because we don't really have that many resources uh, here at Carlton or in Ottawa specific to IBSA. This is something that we should change. This is something that we all could do to, to support survivors uh, more and another area of work. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any comments or questions, please send me an email at my uh, Carlton email. It's classicarasava.com.ca or slide into my ADMs because I'm youth and other language at Victor Sava. Thank you so much.